I would like to thank our sponsor, Calibre Wings, who produce detailed scale die cast models that strive to deliver a detailed experience that incorporates light weathering and colour toning that start from their Wave 3 models. This is finally bundled into a nice collector's box with dedicated illustrative box art to match. To purchase the models that have been shown, please visit CaliberWings.com. Thank you. Your flight training, what did you actually fly? Because I talked to a lot of RAF guys, I know what they flew, so it would be great to hear what the, the Navy guys in the US flew. When I was there, we uh, the the Rios flew uh, or all the NFOs flew the T2 Buckeye, mm. which is a subsonic straight wing, uh, twin engine airplane. The instructor pilot was in the front, and the student NFO was in the back. Uh, it's kind of a stubby looking airplane, but it's uh, reliable and pretty safe. And it was you know it was fun to fly, and it was your, our first jet, so you know we didn't complain. Yeah. Then the Rios moved to the uh, T-39, which was the Sabre liner. And uh, that was fine. You know, it had a radar in the front. It had multiple scopes in the back. And so the students would sit at the different scopes. And sometimes a student would sit in the front uh, co-pilot seat. And that's where we would run our radar intercepts. And we also did some low-level training in it, things like that. And then at the end of the uh, Rio syllabus, we got, I believe, six flights in the TA-4 Skyhawk which is uh, a longtime favorite of uh, Navy pilots. Of and it was definitely the sportiest thing by far that we had flown up to that point. Now, uh, you know, the types change every few years. When yeah. I, after I left, the T-39 went away, they, they got T-47s, I believe, and, and uh, so it, it keeps changing. So going on your training and your ground school, what were the weapon systems like to like even learn to cope with? Well, uh, this is, uh, this is something that the, the Navy does well. And, you know, they've had thousands of students and dozens and dozens of years to, to perfect this. In Pensacola, they start with the basics, so you understand the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we trained on uh, old radars from F-8 Crusaders. Wow. I think it was the APQ-94. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and it's, you know, classroom, simulator, flight. And then, and you start with the basics and then you go to the next level up classroom simulator flight. And so, you know, it just, it, they just keep building, building complexity. As long as you can stay with the program, you keep advancing to the next stage. Of course. Yeah. So, so we get to the F-14 and yeah, it was the most complicated thing that we'd flown. It was the most capable, but you're flying with an instructor pilot. You've got, you know, these excellent uh, training classes. You go through the simulators. They did a nice job of making us ready for it. And how long was the F-14 in service by the time you came to it? Oh, when I got there, it was still, you know, it was still new. They were still rolling off the production okay. line. So, so it joined its first squadrons around 1974, and I showed up at Miramar in 1980. Oh, okay. And, uh, so not long. So, yeah, it was pretty new. And, uh, in fact, when I got there, there, there were still a couple of RF-8s flying at, at Miramar. Wow. You know, no fighter F-8s, but RF-8s. Mm -hmm. And there were still uh, quite a few F-4 squadrons in the Navy. Wow, okay. So you know, the F-14 was still uh, still coming along. So can you briefly actually just explain to our viewers, in case they don't know, what uh, a Rio was? What was your job? Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. The, the Navy assigned Rios several duties uh, just to clarify the crew coordination. So the Rio was assigned uh, navigation and communication responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, the pilots had, had already flown single seat by themselves in the training command, they get there and they've got, you know, a Rio to handle that in the plane. Mm -hmm. So I did navigation communication. And then also uh, the F-14's weapon system was designed in the late 60s. It, it, they couldn't automate a lot of features mm -hmm. and they certainly couldn't automate things like uh, like how to deal with some of the uh, high-end jamming and things that we expected uh, if we were defending the carrier from a, uh, from a Soviet raid. That was the high threat. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted a guy back there to, uh, to operate the radar in those most demanding situations. Mm -hmm. So in addition, the uh, combat experience in Vietnam, um, you know, that helped define Rio duties also. Mm -hmm. So depending on the tactical situation, I would have lookout you know, behind the uh, three nine line and all kinds of things like that. So, uh, you know, I had plenty to do, 
Um, I had no flight controls in the back seat. I could not fly the plane, even in an emergency. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there was plenty of times, and, and pilots would tell you this too, and especially Navy flying, when you're out flying over the wide ocean, there's plenty of times when you can just cruise along and relax and enjoy the view. So, but, uh, but if there's anything going on, I had, uh, I had my hands full and I, it was important that I coordinate with the pilot. So was there a squadron that was more prestigious than any others? Or was the one where everyone wanted to go to or was it not like that? Uh, no, no, uh, it's a lot of personal opinions. You know, uh, I think almost everyone probably thinks that their squadron is, if not the best, then, you know, in the top tier. I think so, yeah. But then, um, you know, I have to look back at some squadrons and I go like, God, those guys never seem to win awards. They don't. But, you know, they went on deployment. They did a good job. And and uh, that, that's their job, you know, is to be a fighter squadron, not to, to win every award. So. This is kind of interesting because uh, my my next fleet squadron uh, in 1987 was VF2, mm-hmm. and I always thought that VF2 was one of the high profile squadrons. Actually, while we're on the topic, here, what does VF stand for? Oh, is it fixed wing? V, very good. V stands for fixed wing, mm-hmm. um, and and I've got a, a history book from the Navy um, way back in the day, and it talks about I believe. Uh, Lighter than air squadrons were a, a Z or Z. Helo squadrons, of course, were H. Yeah. Fixed wing was uh, V. Where they got those letters, I'm not sure. And then F, of course, was uh, fighter. Yeah. But but those the nomenclature of those also changed, um, you know, a couple of times over the years. Yeah. But or, you know now it's VFA. VFA, yeah. So where were you based with uh, VF24? We were based at Miramar. Uh, based ashore at Miramar, and when I joined the squadron, um, uh, we deployed with the uh, USS Constellation. And and just like preference of squadrons, uh, people's opinions of aircraft carriers just depends on what ship they were on and uh, what their experience was. In my opinion, I thought Constellation was a, a pretty good operating ship. Mm-hmm. This is basically in good condition and a good operating ship, and so I like being on Constellation. Um, and then while I was in 24, we, uh, d- we deployed uh, for, sh- for short uh, training deployments to Fallon, Nevada, and El Centro, uh, California, mm-hmm. basically. But it was Miramar and Constellation. And then my second deployment was on the uh, Ranger. I will admit, as I get to this, I will admit to uh, one of the dumbest things that I ever did. <laughs> but I'll get to that. Okay. So, so going back, uh, it's just like new guy joining the squadron. It's just like training. You've got to remember that, that deploying on a carrier is the Navy's business. Yeah. And so when the schedule comes out, uh, they look at the plan and they say, okay, the ship is going to get underway, you know, in the middle of July for a two week training deployment. We have to take eight airplanes. So that means that uh, three days before we go out on the ship, we start packing up everything two days before we go out on the ship. and But you've got these uh, chief petty officers, which is uh, E7s, first class petty officers, E6s, that have been in squadrons most of their lives. I mean, they did shore duty, but I mean, they've got a career mm-hmm. and they were very professional. And then of course, you know, the maintenance officer and the officer uh, cadre. And so these guys have this mobility down to a system. So when you go to the depo- go on the carrier, the squadron packs up and moves to the carrier. Yeah. And and they did it, uh, you know, somewhere, I, I think on my website or somewhere I counted how many times we deployed. And this was because uh, Commander Birch, who was the second, the second CO for when I was in VF-24, he had us make a list of that because he goes, guys, think of how much we've done in the past year. So we listed all the deployments and stuff like that. Wow. So the guy who was the new guy uh, in the squadron, the before the first time we went on the carrier, I packed up a full suitcase or maybe a suitcase and a gym bag 
with, you know, shorts, you know, casual shorts, jeans, tennis shoes, <laughs> golf shirts. Because I'm, I just wasn't thinking. So well, you going on vacation? <laughs> yeah. The good thing was, I took it down to the ship late at night. Nobody was around. I took it on in my room and I stashed it away. I never touched it the whole time we were out, and <laughs> nobody knew that it was out there. You know, I mean, I could, I'll admit it now, but mm -hmm. so like I was a new guy, you know. Of course, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I lived I lived in a uh, flight suit and an occasional khaki uniform for or multiple flight suits. The laundry service was good. So. Yeah. <laughs> so how did Miramar and your squadron prepare you for life on the carrier? You cannot prepare a person for no. that. <laughs> no, it's just um, maybe it's gradual immersion. Like uh, in, in ROTC, when on, we went on summer deployments uh, for, you know, uh, a month. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the lieutenants, the older guys in the carrier tell you, don't forget to do this, whatever. But in terms of living on the carrier, uh, it's... It's mostly a me you know it's a mental thing. Yeah, there's the practical considerations. You do have to take your underwear and all your uniforms and the stuff you are going to wear mm -hmm. based on on where you're going. Um, but it's mental. You know, you've got to go. I'm going to be out here for either two weeks or one month or seven and a half months. Wow. wow. And uh, take a bunch of books. You know, take a bunch of writing paper because back in 1981, my first deployment. There was no internet. There was no email. No, of course. No. There was no satellite TV. You know, it's like, it was, so, you know, so some guys worked out like crazy and all that. And then, and then I don't know if all the Rios did it, I, you know, but something that I did was I would play with all the switches in the back seat. Okay. I mean, the radar adjusting switches, not, you know, the weapons launch switches. Yeah. The, uh, thank you. The, uh, <laughs> so I would run my pulse gain all the way down and then I'd run it back up and I just I just did that all the time because I just had you had a lot of free time mm -hmm. and then of course also uh, sometimes it depends on the pilot in Rio but sometimes you tell each other jokes mm -hmm. you know or or tell stories or talk about movies but then other times you'd go flying and for a whole two hour flight, you would barely say a word. Really? And it's like, oh yeah, okay. it was awesome. And and the first, I knew some guys, a guy named Window, uh, who, uh, who was, was a legend as an F-14 Rio in the community, and mm -hmm. he was in VF-24. Uh, and, uh, you know, a couple other guys, and, and they would talk about that. And I'd go, God, that sounds boring. But then when you get up there and you do it, it's just, so serene, you know, mm -hmm. and so when you get on station, you're up your radio frequency, um, one click on the mic, just click. You hear two clicks back, that means your wingman's on station. Wow, okay. You don't hear anything, you just orbit. A minute later, he'll he'll send a click, and you two, two click, you do two clicks back, and then you can begin your training exercises. Wow, okay. Now, there's other times when, you know, you have to talk to your controller, you talk to your other guys, stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a variety of things. And then we also spent time, um, every once in a while, we would perform a realistic strike, uh, which is a, uh, you know, A6s and A7s would carry either live bombs or simulated bombs. F-14s would escort them or do sweeps or whatever. And, and so sometimes you would do realistic training like that. Yeah. Um, early in my, very early in my career, I escorted a Harpoon cruise missile, which oh, wow. was... Oh, that was awesome. I, I mean, I was, was yeah. I was an ensign. I was flying with John Boy, who was who was just a lieutenant, but he completed one deployment. And, you know, to me, he seemed as, as yeah. you know, mature and everything as Pappy mm -hmm. Boynton himself. Yeah. So so I was very fortunate to, uh, to do this uh, Harpoon cruise missile escort. And and the thing I loved about it is it was dynamic. We went out there the first day. We orbited and orbited, waited and waited, had to go refuel. We're sitting there calculating fuel, distance, location, status updates. Just, you know, you're just being a crew, being yeah. a crew, aviating. Yeah. And then even better was it didn't, they didn't launch the harpoons the first day. So we went back and landed and they go, you guys just go out and do it again the next day. 
<laughs> and so uh, just, you know, the whole mental exercise of positioning the jet to, to uh, see the submarine, um, listening to the countdown, trying to be in the right place for the harpoon launch, and then escorting the harpoon. Just It was just uh, just a great experience for me. And it was challenging, but, you know, as I said, I felt the Navy prepared me for, for that. Well, certainly beats uh, sitting in an office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get, did you ever go up against um, NATO aircraft or the RAF, for instance? Or even the Royal Navy, should I say, as oh. well? Um, we might have fought Harriers out in the Indian Ocean. But I got to tell you, the, uh, the uh, East Coast Tomcat guys would have done a lot more of that than I did. Okay. I was a West Coast guy. The uh, most um, the most common opponents, and, and back then, I mean, in the 80s, we didn't even do much fighting against, uh, you know, uh, friendly countries as we passed by them. Yeah. We, you know, we just, they just, we just weren't doing a lot of that. But on the other hand, um, when we were out in the Indian Ocean, this was in my second second uh, squadron in, in 87, 89. We fought the French in the North Arabian Sea. Okay. And so I finally got to fight against an F-8. And how did you fight? Uh, the, the Tomcat did a great job. So, I mean, I, I love the F-8. When I was a kid, that's the jet I wanted to fly. I respect the F-8, and I probably, you know, F-8, if any F-8 pilot is watching this, he would say, you know, I'll take on a Tomcat any day, which is fine. But, you know, we, we fought them, and uh, we did fine. Mike, everybody, I mean, ask an A-7 guy. He's going to tell you that oh, he tough. shot Tomcats all the time. And, and ask, you know, an A-10 guy, he's going to tell you this, you know. So everybody's going to tell you their good stuff. The problem or the challenges with the F-14 was that we often flew with Phoenix rails, which which uh, reduced your lift, mm -hmm. with external tanks. Uh, these aren't excuses, but it's just the, the reality. I mean, it was just awesome when we got back to Miramar. If we could take off the rails, take off the tanks, and have a lot of gas, that's you know that's the way you wanted a Tomcat to fly all the time. But you know, if if you're out on deployment in combat, it's probably going to be loaded up, and it's. Uh, it was a challenge for the pilots. It was it was uh, required a lot of skill to fly well. So hats off to uh, to Tomcat pilots. And of course, the F-14A, the engines at the time weren't too great, were they? You know, they were barely adequate uh, when they were designed. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize this, and it, this is not classified. But the engines were detuned in the A model for uh, to to for longevity and to increase increase stall margins, so decreased likelihood of stall. Okay. So the, they had reduced the rust over the original design. So, yeah, I mean, the ultimate Tomcat was the F-14D with bigger engines, new radar, uh, and then digital flight controls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and guys I've talked to, I never flew a DFCS, di digital flight controls, but guys I talked to said that made the F-14 the plane it should have been all along. Yeah, I've heard that on many occasions, yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, they didn't put it in until the, uh, the last uh, 10 or 9 years. The current F-14 squadron's caliber wings have in stock are VF-142 Ghost Riders and VF-14 Top Hatters. They are both in 70 second scale with a level of detailed experience one would expect on a high quality plastic kit. You can check them out by visiting caliberwings.com. Thank you. And and it turns out when I went back, the the uh, back then they used to have a wish wish list and a watch list. Right. And uh, and so guys that came through the class, you know, if you were if you were very good, they put you on the wish list. If you were pretty good, they put you on the watch list. And right. <clears throat> so I went back. Uh, it took a long time for me to go back because I had to wait for my numerical replacement at VF twenty four. So my, my reporting to Top Gun was delayed by four months, but they held my spot. And actually, I gave my first lecture, which was a training lecture in the FAST class. I gave that before I had checked into the squadron. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about how the Navy uh, brings people along, uh, you know, in, in training. And they've got decades. You know, I was telling you, I'll tell you what, Top Gun as an organization just – has an incredible, um, you could call it mentoring, 
but just the effort they put into bringing new instructors up to speed because uh, they have they have very strict standards that were established by the uh, the first guys who started the school. And and Mike, those guys who started the school, I mean, this is something that I you know thought about when I was there doing this. Mm-hmm. Those guys who started the school were F four pilots and Rios, F eight pilots. A lot yeah. of them had either MIG kills or they certainly had combat experience yeah. and. And they were certainly, have you read uh, Scream of Eagles? No, I've heard of it, though. I haven't read it. Put that on your list. It, okay. it really tells about the, uh, the personalities of, the, of these guys. But, but the rules they set for themselves were incredible, the highest levels of professionalism. And, and those rules were enforced down through the decades, you know. So when I got there, you, if you're an instructor, you had to write neatly on the whiteboard. Yeah. I don't care if you don't have good handwriting, you better practice because because your other instructors demand that of you. Mm-hmm. And and so um, there's two parts of that equation. And I experienced this. I was the benefactor of this. I think probably almost all instru- top gun instructors are. They not only demand this performance of you, but they will help you whatever it takes to reach that level of performance. I mean, I remember doing a, a murder board on a Friday night at 10 p.m. Oh, ouch. Well, at, at the time, I kind of thought if this guy was checking my uh, commitment, you know, because if I had balked, but he spelled it out for me. He goes, hey, I, I'm, I'm, it was right around Christmas. He goes, I'm busy. I'm going on leave. I've got a lot of stuff to do. He goes, the only time I'm available is Friday night at 10 o'clock. I go, I'll be here. See you here. Yeah. And so you something else. You don't walk in and go, man, it's late. Man. No. <laughs> Not a you morning. No morning. Go, yeah. You walk in and you go, I'm Dave Bioboronic, this but 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 and you better do a good job, you know. I don't care if you're upside down, you know, over a shark tank or whatever. So you have to act anyway. like it was nine AM. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We had an Air Force instructor pilot, Boa, former F fifteen pilot. And I needed a lot of help from him, so I certainly did not want to, to piss him <laughs> Again, off. Bad. Yeah, of course, yeah. No, he, he was, uh, Bo was, was perfect, a perfect representative of the Air Force. He was, as I know, the first, uh, I think he was the first Air Force exchange pilot uh, at Top Gun. Mm-hmm. And he was great. And he, he was very helpful to me because he helped me, yeah, an F-15 pilot helped me get my radar intercept um, procedures where they needed to be because, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe my rag instructors would say, well, bio, you just weren't paying attention or something. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I had good radar intercept capability. I, I did well in the class and challenging scenarios and stuff like that. So I was a good Rio, mm-hmm. but when it came time to, to parse that out, and organize it to give the F-14 radar intercept lecture, I needed a lot of help. Yeah, wow, okay. And, uh, and the F-15s, had, a, had they'd been flying single-seat radar, you know, since the early 70s. Mm-hmm. And so they had a very organized way of, of dealing with it. And so BOA helped me, um, you know, deal with that, or, you know, adapt that to, uh, to the F-14. Yeah. So, Bio, how do the F-5s fare against the F-14s? Uh, <laughs> you know, that that was one of the lessons of Top Gun. Because the instructors would show them in, like, the second day <laughs> uh, fighter performance comparison lecture. And they would show them how the F-14 was numerically superior to the F-5 in most... Um, measurements most important measurements even the detuned f-14 you know but then they would still go out there and the f-5 if the f-14 wasn't flown correctly the f-5 would win because the f-5 let me assure you was flown correctly yeah because it's a top gun instructor flying it he would do what he wanted to do now we had multiple different fights um sometimes 
and then they're still flying F5s up at uh, up at Fallon. Uh, Top Gun's not flying them, but adversary programs are. But you know, we would we would fly the smart fight, we'd fly the aggressive fight, the mirror fight, and there's just all these little code words so that the instructors would go, oh, I know what that is, I know what that is. And he handled, you know, the student either handled it well or didn't handle it well, whatever. We hosted the Air Force Fighter F-15 Fighter Weapons School once. Okay. So they brought their they brought their F-15s down to Miramar, and we're flying our F-5s. Mm-hmm. And that did not go very well. I mean, I was in an F-5F against an F-15D probably, and we... We couldn't do anything. Really? So, so oh yeah. I mean, the, but again, that's a fighter weapons instructor, not uh, an average fleet guy. So you didn't have a chance, basically. No. <laughs> no. So how many times a week would you fly? Oh, uh, you know, it it felt like more than it actually was. But I'm thinking about my logbook. I think I'd fly twenty. 20 to 25 flights per month. But sometimes you'd fly three times a day and then you wouldn't fly for three days. Okay. You know? Yeah. So would that be better than an average uh, frontline squadron? It, it was about the same back then. Right. You know, okay. On the other hand, on the other hand, the, the uh, Top Gun flights were shorter. Mm-hmm. The average flight in the F5 was, you know, I think, 0.8 or 0.9 not it wasn't that bad but yeah. it was short there were there were very few 2 hour flights in the F5 mm-hmm. and you know in the F14 there were 2 hours all the time so so one thing that we were thinking about earlier was was how much flight time did i get in the F14 and in my case i got to 1000 hours less than 3 years after my first flight uh-huh. and so for the first Eight months of that, I only had ninety hours. So I had a I had a pretty high level of of activity to get. Yeah, and then after I got to a thousand hours, though, I was cut off. <laughs> he said, "That's enough for you." Yeah, the schedules <laughs> writer goes, "Okay, you're done." He put me down, to, you know, much lower li- rate. <laughs> so we've all seen these uh, camouflage type aircraft with Top Gun. Were, were they uh, around when you were about? Oh yeah, the uh, we had. Um, did I send you one of the one of my favorite pictures? Shows uh, three F five. Yeah, three staff. And, yeah, yeah. Fl- I mean, and and uh, we thought they were cool. They were cool. Yeah. I mean, instructors thought they were cool, and and they would just every once in a while come up with a new camouflage pattern or something. The the one that I I don't think I have any pictures of, and I don't have any good pictures of certainly, was uh, we had one painted like a uh, Swedish Viggen. Oh wow, it was, that's uh, cool. Dark green and gray kind of splinter. And that looked cool, but then you know a lot of them were uh, were kind of desert, you know, either shades of brown or green and brown. Mm-hmm. But there was one that was uh, green and blue and stuff, um, and they were just one of the instructors. I guess it was the air aircraft division officer. Mm-hmm. It was his privilege to to think of new you know paints. He would talk to the training officer. The training officer would give him a thumbs up, and they'd say, "The guy's okay. Paint him like this," you know. Even more important was that the Navy uh, started to take the forward quarter threat seriously. At the time, it was just uh, MiG 23s with AA7 Apex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Navy's main response was. One, we developed forward quarter tactics uh, and to, to minimize the threat from the apex. They're much simpler than, the, well, than what guys are doing now, but it was something. And two, we started to carry the Phoenix in a tactical environment. Yeah. <clears throat> Before that, the Phoenix was really was reserved for defense of the aircraft carrier mm-hmm. because the carrier can only carry so many of them or could only carry so many of them. Yeah. Of course, they'd get resupply, but that would take days. And, you know, if the war started, you needed them. That was the best missile to deal with a, uh, a, a raid of bombers and cruise missiles. Mm-hmm. So now, though, the tactical threat became significant enough that uh, we started to plan carry, plan carrying Phoenix tactically, and we started to train like that. So uh, at Yuma, at Fallon, uh, we started to train Phoenix against uh, fighters. Mm-hmm. And 
that was pretty cool. You know, it was in the tax range already. The scenario was already there. So we just started using it. Um, VF2 was a good group. Like I said before, it was, I thought it was a, uh, a, uh, it had a, a lot of squadron pride. I mean, all, every squadron does. Yeah. They had a good, uh, a good history of, uh, of awards that they'd won. So, I mean, it, it was good. I was happy to be there. I was glad that I get sent back to uh, VF2. So what, what carry were you uh, sent to uh, at this point? We went on the Ranger twice. Now, the interesting thing here was I'd been on the Ranger once when I was in VF24. Uh -huh. But the Ranger back then had a deferred maintenance period. And so it was, a, it was just a beat up ship. <laughs> right. And two... VF-24 and 211 and Airwing-9 only made one deployment on the Ranger. And everywhere we went, they said, well, Airwing-2 did it like this. And you guys aren't like Airwing-2. And it's like, hey. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. So when I went on Ranger back in 1987, I was in Airwing-2. Mm -hmm. So it's like, welcome back, Airwing-2. <laughs> you know, and then also it had been in the shipyards and it come out. It was nice. Yeah. Air conditioning worked better. They had more fresh water. I mean, this is a much better ship, just, you know, a, a shipyard period. So yeah. the Ranger was a good ship in my experience. Were the Hornets uh, about at this time? Hornets were in the fleet, but on the Ranger at that time, we had two Tomcat squadrons and two A6 squadrons, no oh. Hornets. Okay, right. And in fact, one of my uh, more fun uh, flights was when the, the Ranger did a passing exercise with the Midway out near the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And so they sent their Hornets to attack us and we sent our stuff to attack them. So when you're out there flying, if it's a Hornet, it's hostile. Yeah. And, and I went on a, a fun flight where we uh, intercepted a bunch of Hornets, uh, but, but they were simulating strikers. So, uh, you know, they're simulating like, uh, simulating like uh, fitters or stuff. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't simulating MiG-29s or something. They weren't trying to fight us. Yeah. We fought them a couple of times in training. Like uh, just for training, we'd meet up somewhere and, and fight them back then. And then my third tour, I was in uh, VF-211, still flying F-14As. And we had three Hornet squadrons in the air wing. Wow. And so I, I fought Hornets plenty of times. And, um, you know, that's a good jet. I mean, I'm – and the pilots are well-trained, so – you know, it, it would be disappointing if uh, if the jet that was designed, you know, 10 or more years newer mm -hmm. uh, as the lightweight fighter, yeah. it would be disappointing if it wasn't a good jet. Yeah. So, so did you ever think it was a realistic, um, you know, kind of threat that you would be launched and actually have to shoot a missile? When you first go out there, I remember on my first deployment, we would think, I'm going to get a MiG, I'm going to get a MiG. Well, this is 1981. There had been a Libyan shoot down, but, you know, that was a, that was a fluke. Mm -hmm. There was no combat. There was no combat on the horizon, and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So then after a while, you go, okay, probably nothing will ever happen. So then in 1987, when I went on my deployment with VF-2, as we're going through the Philippines, headed over towards the uh, uh, North Arabian Sea, VF-21 fired AIM-7s at a declared hostile in the Strait of Hormuz. Wow. That is reported in the, uh, the book Tanker Wars. It's, yeah. it's well done. And, and so you're sitting there going like, because you sit there and you go, I've been flying caps, you know, for mm -hmm. a thousand hours and nothing happens. When those guys launched, they had no idea they would – that would be, you know, they would get that clearance. And then here they are cleared to fire and they shot missiles. Mm -hmm. So you never know, you know, when it's, when it's going to start. And then the other thing is we always had war plans. We always uh, practiced them and, you know, we had to refresh the plans and do our own planning. And so, you know, I remember looking at the map of potentially hostile countries where there were, you know, targets and you're going like, okay, this is where we'll go in. This is blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and of course, you always carry live weapons, loaded, loaded uh, 20 millimeter, uh, so you know you're ready. 
And then, and then later, when I was in 211, we flew, I was there in 97, 98, and our squadron flew uh, Southern Watch. Mm-hmm. So we uh, patrolled the uh, no-fly zone. And, and But I thought we were going to shoot. Uh, I thought we were going to get to shoot, but we didn't. No. Probably a but good thing in a way. Did. A couple of uh, VF-213 crews uh, launched Phoenix in 1999. Mike, you're doing you're doing a service to the community. If uh, you know if there had been YouTube when I was uh, a teenager, I'd be I'd be hanging out waiting for your next video to come out. So thanks, <laughs> oh, thanks very much. From a much. kid who was there. <laughs>